Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you again for joining us for the Threatened Species Initiative online open course, Conservation Genomics for Threatened Species Management. So today I will be going over the information about sample collection, storage, and study design, in protect, particular about creating reference genomes um, and data for population genetics, um, in particular about invertebrates and um, <clears throat> specifically about corals, coral reef um, associated organisms. So I just want to say that this information is really encapsulated in a recent publication that we had in the Frontiers of Marine Science, and that um, the theory behind this information uh, is in that paper called Consensus Guidelines for Advancing Coral, Holobiont, Genome, and Specimen Voucher Deposition. So check out the paper as well as the supplementary material. Um, because the practice of doing it, including different reagent recipes, step-by-step uh, -step how-to guides, is really found in the supplementary. So if you want the theory behind what we'll talk about today, check out the main paper. But if you're really into the nitty-gritty how-to, uh, check out the supplementary information. So within that paper, we really tried to outline a roadmap for how people could start to think about collecting samples for reference genomes uh, in an organism like a holobiont. So a holobiont is a composition of different organisms, including uh, the coral host, which I'll focus on today. But we also discussed how to take samples for reference genomes for bacteria consortia inside the corals, as well as for different um, for different dinoflagellate taxa of the photosymbionts that live inside of corals. But I'll just, uh, for this talk, be restricted to the coral host. Um, and to say that uh, coral sperm is a very good place to get uh, genomic material for reference genomes because it's relatively pure uh, coral DNA. So most corals don't have symbionts. Well, all corals don't have symbionts associated with the sperm. There is some symbionts associated with some eggs of particular coral species, um, but this unfortunately requires collection during coral spawning, which can be quite challenging and limiting. So you get really good DNA, but collecting it can be a bit more tough. Alternatively, you can get genomic DNA from coral fragments um, from a coral adults. Um, but oftentimes you'll get that kind of contaminating DNA of different microbial partners in that. And so we have protocols for both methods. Um, and we also go through what you can get from that genomic DNA, as well as what you need to get in terms of metadata associated with each, with each of these processes. So please take a look at the manuscript for more detail. And we go through um, what you need in terms of what to do for good preservation what metadata you need to have associated with, with each sample collection, as well as try to take a longer term perspective in terms of what kind of metadata you can take that would help other people um, with their science down the track. And we do recognize that it is hard to get some of the metadata. It is hard to um, potentially have facilities that you can perform coral spawning in. So we really tried to break it down in terms of the minimum information needed, um, but the ideal um, metadata associated with each sample in order to really avoid some of the pitfalls that we've seen with uh, previous constructions of coral genomes uh, in the past. So take a look at table one in order to see what's the minimum, but also what is the gold standard in terms of the data uh, that should go in conjunction with that genomic sample. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> oftentimes you need to go into the field to collect your sample. So what do you need to think about even before you lay eyes on your sample organism? Well, number one, you need to make sure you have all the permits and permission associated with your country or region of location. Um, and that can be quite specific uh, per per location. So really make sure that you've looked into the regulatory framework about doing sample collections, especially if your uh, species is on the IUCN red list of threatened species. They have special considerations. Um, 
and that you really need to have taxonomic information, type specific uh, taxonomic information known um, before you collect your, your reference genome individual. We recommend printing underwater guides if possible. So doing your taxonomic homework, uh, looking to see what's the um, background in terms of species designations and finding diagnostic photos and then printing them off, laminating them and bringing them in the field with you during collections. Um, something to consider is if you will be uh, tracking that individual over time in the field. So will you have a little field identifier, as we can see here in the photo, um, associated with that individual so you can go back and collect in the future? Or potentially you might be bringing a part of that individual, part of that colony into the lab in order to track it further through time. Um, so that's something to, to think about and make sure that you know what metadata you'll be collecting in the field before you get there. Um, so in terms of once you're in the field, what will you be collecting? Um, so we have this helpful figure in the supplements in terms of the kind of photos that you should be shooting for um, when, you're, when you're in situ, when you're in the field. And number one, you want a wide shot. And we like to say that this gets the vibe of the location. So you want to try to take a zoomed out photo of the general habitat in which your organism uh, exists in. And um, oftentimes this is accompanied by trying to get the whole colony as possible in the frame. You also want to take a close up of the uh, structure of the colony. And this can be quite important for diagnostic uh, taxonomic diagnostic work in the future. Um, and you want to try to take a in-depth uh, or as much of an in-depth focused um, photo of the polyp structure, the sanisark or the, the area between the polyps. Again, because these are all really diagnostic features that help to um, determine taxonomic designations down the track, which is critically important when you have a reference genome. And so again, I really highly recommend that um, people look at the supplementary material in this manuscript so they can really get make sure that they can get each of these shots while in the field and then once they're back in the field. Um, and again, make sure you have your metadata. And this can include depth, habitat type, time of day, um, all the things associated with the field, and that is uh, in order to complement that voucher specimen or that reference genome specimen as much as possible down the track. So how do you sample for DNA, um, including how you store for it? Um, so corals can be very dirty, and that means that um, they often have a very high microbial load, and that can really expedite the amount of degradation that you get during storage or after storage. So you really want to work clean, as clean as possible. Um, we found that the best uh, scenario for reference genome creation is snap freezing in liquid nitrogen, and that really... Um, preserves uh, the, the genomic material immediately, um, but oftentimes this can't be done in particular field stations, maybe you're on a boat, or maybe the actual transport of those uh, samples becomes problematic and it's un you're not able to keep it cold enough during storage. So although that is the best possible storage, material, uh, storage uh, method for genomic material for re reference genomes, Sometimes the logistic makes, logistics make it impossible. The second best is to store in a DESS solution, which is a mixture of DMSO, EDTA, and a salt preservation buffer. Um, and so that's more of a chemical storage. And you can either freeze that or store it at minus uh, 20 after you've added that uh, DESS solution. And that recipe can be found again in the supplement, so I won't outline it here. Um, but long term uh, is really trying to keep it as cold as possible to prevent degradation. So aim for minus 20. But if you have to, for example, if you're at a field station without a minus 20 capability, or if you're on a boat doing collections, room temperature in the short term is okay. Um, but you really want to get it into minus 20 as uh, quickly as possible. So if you're lucky enough to be a part of coral spawning, you can then target the sperm 
um, that is produced during coral spawning. And again, the major benefit of that is that it doesn't come with any potential contaminants of, uh, for example, photosymbionts, which can make uh, sequencing quite challenging and getting enough host sequences quite challenging. So the best thing you can do is to flash freeze the sperm in liquid nitrogen. But in order to do that, you really need to concentrate it. So we recommend uh, um, placing the concentrated sperm into 15 mil falcon tubes, these conical uh, tubes, about five mil per tube of concentrated sperm, spin it down at about 3000 G for 10 minutes, wash the sperm in TE buffer, um, centrifuge it again for 10 minutes, take off that supernatant of that now cleaned sperm, scoop it out with a spatula, put it in a cryovial, and then freeze it at, in liquid nitrogen and store it at minus 80. This seems to be the absolute gold standard for getting nice coral reference genome, but because of the logistics of liquid nitrogen and spawning, oftentimes it's not possible. But if you do have this option, we highly recommend going down this route. And of course, one of the key critical uh, pieces of information, metadata, to go along with that tissue, whether that be the adult tissue or the sperm from that individual, is to have a skeletal voucher. So that is a representative chunk of coral that can be lodged in a museum. So after you've taken the material from that individual, you want to remove the tissue, you want to have it cleaned, bleach, skeleton ready for museum repository, um, keep it in a plastic bag, room temperature, and deposit it in a natural history museum with a registration number that can be linked to that genomic voucher. And we have a list of different um, natural history museums that would be happy to house your different um, skeletal vouchers that go with your reference genomes. And again, that can that information can be found as well as recommendations for how big the colony has to be and what are the really critical diagnostic features that that skeleton needs to display in order for it to be a voucher specimen for that reference genome. So if you're shipping your sample, you must remember regulatory compliance. And um, we have to remember that many of these species, including corals here, are on a precipitous drop in terms of species, uh, individual numbers per species. So many are on the IUCN red list of threatened species, which means that they're under particular reg um, regulatory frameworks. And in particular, permitting is incredibly important as well as the import export requirements in terms of um, CITES, so the Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species and Wild Flora, as well as the Nagoya Protocol, which I'll talk about next. So I highly recommend that people jump on these websites to check out more information about what CITES means and um, what you need to do in order to move your potential voucher specimen and reference genome um, to the sequencing facility or that skeleton to a natural history museum for deposition. So highly recommend that you do your uh, compliance homework and check out the regulations around CITES. And then um, the Nagoya protocol really describes access and benefit sharing. So I'll leave this information up so people can really digest it because um, it is slightly complex, but it is a global regulatory framework that has uh, that was passed at the Convention of Biological Diversity, which ena enables countries to monitor the access and the use of genetic resources for use in research or developmental purposes. So this is all about trying to increase the, the equity in, in genetic resource use. Um, and because of this, different parties must comply with the different access and benefit sharing laws. And these are um, quite specific and different countries have signed up or in the process of signing up to Nagoya. So I really recommend that each uh, researcher familiarizes themselves not only with the general Nagoya framework, um, but also what are the specific regulatory frameworks for your country um, where your organisms are coming from. And I would also encourage people to um, understand exactly what uh, the kind of genetic resources um, 
what kind of genetic resources fall under the Nagoya protocol. Um, so again, I'll leave this up so that people can actually uh, read it in their own time because it is a lot to process, but make sure you look at your regulatory frameworks before you start shipping samples around. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you and remind everyone that we have 10 uh, different modules to look at um, and to thank our different Threatened Species Initiative contributors. Thanks.